Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Shackman. In Matthew 13, it says, You will hear of wars and rumors of war. But do not panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. And perhaps it is that even the end of the Vietnam War is still with us. There has been a lot of talk this week about reliving and relitigating the 60s. Least we not forget that at the heart of the 60s division was the Vietnam War, a war that was passionately covered by some of the greatest reporters of the time. One of those reporters was Sidney Shanberg. He died last week. Beyond his Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of Vietnam, Shanberg's story for the New York Times magazine, The Death and Life of Dith Pran, was the basis for the movie, The Killing Fields. Back in 1999, 17 years ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with Sidney Shanberg, along with another war correspondent and National Book Award winner, Philip Caputo, to reminisce and reflect on their Vietnam War coverage. The occasion was an anthology of Vietnam War reporting published by the Library of America. What's amazing is how prescient so much of what they reported and said was in looking at the world today. Here is that conversation with Sidney Shanberg and Philip Caputo from February of 1999. Sidney Shanberg served in the U.S. Army from 1956 to 1958. He joined the staff of the New York Times in 1959. He was the Albany Bureau Chief in New York. He was the New Delhi Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and he was the Southeast Asia Correspondent from 1973 to 1975. He won a Pulitzer Prize, a George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting, and his article, The Death and Life of Dith Pran, in the New York Times Magazine section became the basis of the movie The Killing Fields. My other guest, Philip Caputo, served as an officer with the U.S. Marines in Vietnam from 1965 to 1966. He joined the staff of the Chicago Tribune in 1968, working as a foreign correspondent from 1972 until 1977. It is my pleasure to have them both here on the program today. Sidney Phillip, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. It is a remarkable collection of work of a very remarkable time. Talk a little bit about the camaraderie, particularly during the period that, that the both of you were there, which were in, in, in the later years, in the 70s, the camaraderie that existed or the relationship that existed between the journalists that were covering the war. Philip, why don't you start? Well, um, there was uh, there, there was actually quite a bit uh, of that. Um, oh, some of the uh, let me point out, by the way, that um, my coverage of the war was confined to the very f final months of it. Um, I wasn't there, in other words, very long as a journalist. Although I was there for a year and a half in the service, there, there was quite a bit of com camaraderie there. Um, a lot of uh, the people that. Uh, covered the final months the, of, of the war, the last uh, campaign of the uh, North Vietnamese uh, that won the war, had covered Vietnam before, or uh, as in my case, we had covered uh, other conflicts in uh, the Middle East and uh, in North Africa. I, I recall being on the uh, terrace of the Continental uh, Palace Hotel and, and, and seeing just about everybody I knew in the trade. Sidney, you were, were there during the later years, and in fact, in one of your pieces, you talk about the fact of, of being almost a newcomer there to, to the war. Talk about the experience when you first arrived. Well, <clears throat> although I'd, I'd been in the, uh, in the Army, it was peacetime. Unlike uh, Phil, I had never seen combat. And uh, it is very surreal. In fact, uh, it, you can laugh at things now, but my first... My first uh, uh, experience with weapons fired in anger uh, was in Laos, in a little town uh, that was surrounded by the Patet Lao, the communist uh, guerrillas. And uh, I was just looking. The town was mostly deserted, and a group of journalists uh, were uh, flown down in a helicopter. And that was my first. It was 1970, and... Uh, our trip was over, and the helicopter returned, and I was taking a picture of everybody getting on the helicopter, including some Laotians from the town who were trying to scramble on and, and hitch a ride, <clears throat> because the place was uh, going to be taken later on by the communists. And uh, suddenly there's this puff of dust to the left of the helicopter. I had no idea what it was. 
and people are yelling at me, and if something's wrong, I don't know what it is, and they're yelling for me to get on, you know, to run and get on the helicopter. And then there's another puff of dust to the right, and what, a, what those puffs were were mortars being fired from the hills that were bracketing the helicopter, first left, then right, and the next one was obviously, you know, supposed to, supposed to hit it, and we just took off and, and got out of there. But I had no idea what they were, and it was sort of, and when I say I was green, that is absolutely right. You were green, but by 1972, when you got to Southeast Asia, you had, I assume, some very uh, strong preconceptions about the war there. Well, I'd, I'd been there uh, in 70, in Cambodia and Vietnam and Laos and uh, also Thailand, and I'd, in 1972... Uh, I spent the better part of the year in Vietnam, and uh, I think it—I mean, I think it was clear that uh, that the American side wasn't winning the war, and that the other side was, and that they had their their troops and their leaders were more committed to seeing it to the end, and. Uh, I mean, and 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 we we weren't committed in the same way. And and also for a whole bunch of other reasons, I think the policy was terribly flawed, and uh, and we were in the wrong place. We didn't understand Vietnam historically, culturally, uh, and uh, so I mean I I think we were we were destined to lose the war. Although as many military men will point out, we didn't lose the battles. Uh, and uh, we, you know, American soldiers fought well, but they didn't know what they were fighting for, and therefore, uh, by you know, by 1972 or so, when troops were being uh, reduced, uh, I think they were there was a, a, just a lot of very low morale. Philip, talk about uh, the American soldier and your experience as a Marine officer when you first arrived in '65. Well, at that time in 1965, because confidence was running um, very high, uh, I would say actually too high, um, the troops, um, including the brigade I was with, were very well trained, uh, highly motivated, um, and um, I would say very very skilled as fighting men. Um, and as Sidney said, I believe that the American soldier, whether Marine, Army, or otherwise, um, um, fought uh, at least credibly, if not well, uh, very well in, uh, in, in Vietnam, considering uh, the circumstances. But um, as was pointed out many, as has been pointed out many, many times, um, you know, it was a war with a very large political, even cultural component. And military prowess was only part of the equation. Uh, and uh, it was, I think as Sidney suggested at least, uh, is, is that um, it was the other parts of the equation that we never got. Mm -hmm. the, um, the other side, I'm, I can't speak for Cambodia or Laos, but um, yeah, that was what I was familiar with. The political component was, was um, in the coherence, the cohesiveness, of uh, North Vietnamese society, um, and hence in its military actions, uh, um, as compared to the fragmentation and lack of common purpose, say, in South Vietnam. And there was really nothing we could do about that. Talk about this, this cultural aspect, and you, you, do you deal with it, certainly in, in rumor of war, but talk about the sense, or was there a sense, or what the sense was, of the cultural aspect among the soldiers fighting there in Vietnam? I mean, we know what it was domestically. We know what was happening on the streets of America. What was the feeling like there? Well, uh, you know, initially, I mean, there, there would be like two components to that cultural aspect. One is is that we were in a an alien cultural sea in Vietnam, and we didn't understand it. We had no idea what was going on. Um and you quite often had the feeling when you went out on patrol that you were entering some kind of, as I say, hostile uh, sea, um, uh, surrounded by people that were uh, re really 
then among ourselves, of course, there was there was a uh, there was in sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven. The troops were pretty um, uh, cohesive in the sense that they felt like the war was right and that the war needed to needed to be fought and won. Um, it was only later, and this I I only know vicariously or through friends of mine, that you had the cultural divisions that were then fragmenting the United States that came over with with uh, with the troops to Vietnam, especially after the Tet Offensive in 1968. And then there was, there was I gather, quite a bit of divisiveness, especially between officer and enlisted. Sid, so you talk a little bit about Laos and Cambodia and the well, American experience <clears throat> there. They were different insofar as they had not been at war. And although there were there were uh, communist guerrilla forces out there. They didn't amount to very much, and uh, and they were two little countries uh, that were used by all the so-called great powers as uh, proxy warriors. These were surrogate wars fought on other people's ground with other people's soldiers and people. And the Chinese, uh, you know, supported the Khmer Rouge, and uh, the Soviets supported the Vietnamese who were on Cambodian soil, and uh, and uh, uh, so it, you know, the, well, excuse me, the, the Soviets supported the the, uh, the North Vietnamese who were on Cambodian soil, and uh, everybody had their little army that was. Uh, uh, Fighting in uh, Laos was a little bit different. That wasn't uh, uh, we American CIA uh, uh, units uh, trained uh, the Hmong tribesmen to fight the Patet Lao guerrillas, and at least thirty thousand of the Hmongs uh, died in the war. Uh, in Cambodia, we know Cambodia today as a ruined country. And that is because that we we set we set in motion all the great powers set in motion historical forces that brought to power the Khmer Rouge, who were uh, uh, you could call them radicals, but they go beyond radicalism. They uh, they they decided they were going to create a utopia, a rural uh, farming utopia in Cambodia by erasing everybody who came out of the bourgeois classes and the commercial classes, that is, the cities, and anybody who had an education. Mm -hmm. They were essentially committing genocide against uh, uh, the educated urban part of the uh, population, and did so. And as many as two million people died out of a total of maybe eight or nine million people. In, in just the three and a half years that they held power in the late 70s. So now we're still, we're 20 years later, and the country is still a toxic wasteland as a result of, of decades of civil war and massacre and genocide and uh, disease and, and, and famine. All of this with the perspective of looking back. Sydney, you write in, in Volume 2 in Reporting Vietnam, you have a piece uh, in 1972 about the relationship between the military and the press. Talk a little bit about that. Well, there was that, that piece was really about one side of the relationship between the military and the press. That is the, the official side in Saigon. Right. And there was this rather comic ritual that was held every day, first the... Uh, uh, I think it was first at 5 o'clock, and then they moved it to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, where the American public relations officers and the South Vietnamese public relations officers would get up and tell us what had happened that day. And it was uh, usually a very, very stilted account, very boilerplate. And you really couldn't tell who won or who lost, except that they gave the most optimistic figures they could uh, think of. And so you really would have to get out of the city to uh, and see for yourself. In other words, you, every reporter knew that you couldn't trust what you were hearing there as anything like a complete picture. So, and there was a, and, and 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 mostly it really was it really was uh, just a circus kind of ritual. Everybody went along with it, and uh, but very few uh, reporters used it as the uh, uh, primary basis for stories. And then the language used is the kind of language that we have developed uh, 
uh, to even greater heights now. Uh, you know, we, we called, we, we, uh, napalm was called soft ordinance and, uh, collateral damage, uh, came into uh, general usage. You know, pu- the public began to hear about collateral damage. That's when, that's when civilians get killed. That's collateral damage. And all these words that are designed to sanitize war, which is anything but, uh, Sanitary. Philip, how how aware were American soldiers of what the press coverage was like back home of the war? It was uh, early on. It was it was fairly sketchy. About the only, um, especially if you were in a an infantry battalion as I was, you were way out in the sticks, and you didn't get much in the way of um, newspapers. And usually that would be Stars and Stripes, which was the Armed Forces. Uh, paper and tended to uh, not entirely but tended to reflect you know the the, the, uh, the military point of view and there was all, all I would get would be just um, would be uh, stories that my parents would send back from uh, from home or they would write a letter and say that you know, the paper said this was happening, that was happening. I, I, I even as a, as a, as a young platoon commander, I saw that there was a, yeah, as early as 1966, there was a grave disconnect between a lot of the stuff that was, the, that was reported and what was really happening, except in those cases when you had a reporter who actually got out uh, and, and saw the fighting firsthand. Um, but whatever uh, the news was based on, what as Sydney mentioned, that ritual, which was known as the five o'clock follies, mm-hmm. um, it it it, uh, it came off as as a kind of a through the looking get glass kind of thing. It was it was pure Alice in Wonderland. You both write extensively about the final days of the war, Philip. Watching uh, the final days in seventy five of the war. What were your thoughts as somebody that was there uh, for for you know ten years before at the very beginning of the exercise? Well, I, well, well it was it was very strange to me that um, I was there ten years later, and it was as though the intervening ten years of my life had not happened, um, and I was just suddenly transported back to where I was, and 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 that the situation with the rather uh, huge exception that most of the American troops, I think all of them actually, were out by the time I came back in 75. But but the situation on the ground was not any different than when I had been there in uh, in 65. And um, But the other, and then I think the feeling that affected me the deepest was, was that although in my own mind by that time I had come to oppose the war, come to think of it as as a really grave mistake. I mean, bordering on, I think, on, on criminal behavior on, on part of some of our political and military leaders. That um, I was nevertheless very emotionally attached to the men that I had served with, and many of whom, 15 of whom, I can count their names on the wall in Washington, who had uh, been killed in action. And so to suddenly see this whole effort um, collapse in defeat was, uh, was a very personally painful experience for me. Um, and, and I had kind of, a, I, I had a lot of difficulty trying to be objective uh, in my reporting about it. Um, and, and trying to suppress my my own uh, emotions about it. Although I did write one sort of like an op-ed piece, very very highly personal emotional piece. It's not in this book, but it was it was in in the form of a letter to the first two men in in our battalion who were uh, who were killed in action. Um, and just I sort of wrote to them uh, uh, as, as as to what was going on in Vietnam and what I thought about it. Sydney, as you watched the end of the war, particularly the fall of uh, Cambodia, what were your emotional responses? Well, I guess 
I mean, I guess uh, what I was doing was hoping for the best, uh-huh. some kind of reconciliation between the warring parties, because now the great powers would disappear. And uh, now that they'd had their use of the country, I mean, the country really was just used as a pawn. Uh, and I, as I say, I hope, uh, as, as virtually every Cambodian whom I knew, whom I talked to, uh, hoped, that the Khmer Rouge, once having had victory, would not have any uh, need for vengeance and reprisal and so forth. That didn't turn out to be the case, obviously. And uh, I think we were also seeing, I, was, I mean, it was, it was depressing. And uh, more than depressing, it was, it was uh, wrenching to see your friends marched off into the countryside for this, quote, glorious revolution when you knew that most of them were not going to survive. They couldn't survive uh, under the conditions that we knew they were going to be placed under. And uh, they were frightened and uh, weeping. And that's really what it was, a frightened, weeping time. And uh, the foreigners who were there, including myself, were spared. Uh... But uh, by being by taking refuge in the French embassy, although it wasn't regarded as a sanctuary by the Khmer Rouge. But anyway, it's a very very hard thing, as Philip pointed out, to to watch a culture to which you become attached, or a mission to which you become attached, if you were if you were hoping for victory, say in Vietnam, uh, and to watch the whole thing fall apart and not know what was going to come next, because we didn't, certainly didn't know in Cambodia. At what point, if at any point, did you, did you come to believe that victory was impossible? In Cambodia, it was the first year I was there, in 1970, I began to believe that. It wasn't a firm belief, because it was clear that, that, we, were, that, that we and the Soviets and the Chinese were simply using this country to divert you know, for, to divert attention or to, as, an, as an ancillary battlefield for Vietnam. In the America's case, we were using it to divert attention. In other words, we were building up this Cambodian army as a light infantry army to engage North Vietnamese divisions, in other words, to take them away from uh, activity in Vietnam so that right. we could withdraw our soldiers in a, in a, in a safer uh, environment. Uh, so I never thought... I never thought the goal was to win. I think it was simply to use them so that Vietnam, the main, you know, circle of the the, the main ring of the circus, could come out in some face-saving way. Philip, did you ever think uh, victory was possible? Um, only, only when I went there in in '65. Um, I mean, I, I had become skeptical about the chances of victory as early as 66, but by 1970, by which time I was already, I mean, I was out of uniform. I was, uh, by then, working as a uh, newspaper man. Um, with the Cambodian invasion and and what resulted from it, I became convinced at that time that victory was impossible and, uh, and that uh, to pursue the war any further um, repeat something I said earlier, would be to take the policy from a grave mistake, I thought, in, in, into one that I regarded as criminal behavior. I don't mean the kind that you can be indicted for, but I meant, I meant the kind that's, that's just morally wrong, not just a mistake, but morally wrong. And, um, and as a fact, I said so. I wrote a letter to <laughs> President Nixon. Um, uh, 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 telling telling him that, and I joined the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and I uh, sent my medals back to the president, and all of that kind of thing, and um, uh, and and uh, I I became persuaded at that time that that uh, that we were we were just uh, I it was almost like that that old song from uh, from World War One we're here because we're here because we're here because, because we're, here. we're here except that people were being killed at the same time. Gentlemen, we were talking a little bit about the the optimism and pessimism that was part of the experience. You know, when we look back at it, that the, the sort of knee-jerk reaction, the thing that comes immediately to mind, is all the negatives. The negatives in terms of the attitude here, the failures there, uh, 
But there were periods of time, it seems to me, as one reads these stories, that there was a sense of, at, at various points, some optimism over there about the war. Sidney, talk about that. Well, I, I don't recall a time uh, in my own personal experience where there was a lot of optimism. There was official optimism. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1972, I covered the Easter Offensive when the North Vietnamese came across the DMZ with, uh, and several other places into South Vietnam uh, with tanks and, and artillery and so forth, and almost took the country then. And uh, and were held off, really, by uh, massive uh, air power, B-52s and all kinds of planes and Cobra helicopters, and uh, and and really literally bombed from morning till night. It was really around the clock bombing to hold off uh, these troops from taking province capitals and possibly Saigon. Uh, so there was, I think, a feeling of success when that was over, that military power had won the day. But I never felt any optimism as, you know, as you wandered around battlefields or, you know, talked to your Vietnamese friends, that, that victory was at hand. Philip, was there ever for you over there the experience of, of, of what I think it was McNamara that called the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel? Uh, I can't say that, no. But but in in the early days of of our involvement, in this war, um, there was a some uh, feeling of optimism that we could and would win, um, and a lot of that optimism was a carryover from the from the uh, high tide of the Camelot era of, uh-huh. uh, of John Kennedy, President John Kennedy. Um, and, um, but by 1960, with the Tet Offensive in 1968, I think that was the great dividing line there, um, it became obvious that after three years of optimistic and sunny pronouncements from Secretary of Defense McNamara, from Lyndon Johnson, from General Westmoreland, uh, none of which it turns out that these men, uh, None of these men, it turns out, believed in anything they were saying to the American public. But um, that all of a sudden, this enemy that 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 the American public had been told was on its knees and ready to cry uncle, rises up out of nowhere and is able to attack targets throughout the entire country of South Vietnam. Turned out to be a horrendous military defeat for the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, but it really was a psychological triumph for them. But we, through uh, this false optimism of ours that was promulgated through the pronouncements of political and military leadership, uh, uh, built the foundation for that psychological victory. I think a lot of people in the American public said, well, wait a minute, what the hell's going on? If these guys were were ready to be defeated, um, what's going on here? And I think that was that was really the end uh, of of American optimism. Um, mm-hmm. Not only in so far as that war goes, but I think there was some of the optimism that's almost part of our American nature. Not all of it, but some of it was uh, was was diminished then and it has remained so. Sydney, talk a little bit about the the sort of lack of clarity in the American mind in terms of what this war was about, the moral ambiguity. Even though there was, uh, you know, what, what the the evil empire in a different form, there was great, great ambiguity. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, if you really follow the public pronouncements of our leadership group, I mean, you know, at one point uh, the Russians were our primary enemy, and then it was the Chinese. And, uh, uh, you know, we kept shifting. We 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 kept changing the rationale as we went along. It was clear we didn't have a, a, a coherent notion. There, North uh, uh, Vietnam was never a strategic interest. It wasn't a matter of national. And if you look back, you you you, were, you really wonder. It's easy to I mean you know hindsight is twenty twenty, but it's easy it's easy to think. Well, if the French decided to get the hell out, uh, 
and they had a much stronger cultural connection with uh, with Vietnam. Then what were we doing running in where angels fear to tread? Uh-huh. And I think it's because, partly because, we as Americans believe that, you know, we can overcome any obstacle. And if the French can't do it, we'll show them how it's done. Yep. Uh-huh. And, um, and we're the can-do people. And um, all of that just fell apart in the midst of a culture that was... Uh, it many times impenetrable for us. And we should not have imagined that we were going to understand uh, this uh, generation-long war. But we were, we were cocky, and, uh, uh, and it, 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 that defeated us, not, as, as Philip pointed out, not military prowess. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, any day as a journalist that I was able to... Uh, I felt I was able in writing my stories to get inside the the, the mind and the thoughts of the Vietnamese or the Cambodians or the Laotians. By, say, 20%, I thought I was successful. Uh People say 20%, that's nothing. Uh, But it's not nothing. Because you're talking about a huge culture gap. And uh, even my friend Dith Pran will say to me uh, one time when we were together, and I, I said, we were having a debate about something, about what, what something meant. And I said, well, you told me everything, didn't you? You, 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 you know, you, you didn't hold anything back. And he said, look, he said, I tell you 80%, 20% I have to keep for myself. Uh-huh. And that means I can't, that, that, that's, that's, that's a man responding in a way, to his colonial heritage, saying, I have to keep 20% for myself. And, and, uh, and I think most of the time, it, you know, it's closer to 80%. From your historical understanding, obviously, uh, Sydney, you served in, in the military in peacetime, and, and Philip, you're too young. But how was the journalism that came out of Vietnam, do you think, different than the kind of journalism that came out of the Second World War? The, the stuff that came out of Vietnam, uh, one thing is that I, I, I think it was a lot more candid about what battle and what combat um, was really like. Um, this was not due uh, you know, to some uh, um, difference in the talent of the writers by any means, but this was due to the lifting of censorship that occurred during the Vietnam War. The one thing is that there wasn't a journalist uh, in Vietnam that that operated under any censorship whatsoever, or if any, uh, it was it was minimal. Certainly nothing compared to what they did in World War II, and I think that was one of the big differences. And the, the other one, perhaps even larger, is that in World War II, the journalists were on the side of uh, of the country, uh-huh. uh, and the country in the sense of the government and the military. I mean, there was my impression. I mean, I was you know born then. I wasn't uh, conscious of what was right. going on, but uh, but my sense of it is is that uh, everybody thought of themselves as all engaged in one single national effort. But and 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 interestingly enough. Um, uh, there, there are there have been uh, books about uh, about this. Uh, one one that's called Once Upon a Distant War by William Procknow about uh, three, well about several, but but mainly three famous journalists: David Halberstam and, uh, and Neil Sheehan and um, Malcolm Brown um, and uh, Peter Arnett also. And 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 in the early part of the war, the journalists tended to be on the side of, of, of the U.S. and the Vietnamese government and the U.S. and the Vietnamese military. And it was only when this disconnect between what they were being told was happening and what they saw happening with their own eyes that you began to get a, a real division between, between the press and, I don't know what to call it, the establishment, the authorities. And, and so consequently, you, you, you eventually got kind of dissident sort of journalism uh, in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Sydney, would you expand on that? Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, Phil is absolutely right. The, uh, 
for for the top brass, not the field officers, not the majors and the even some of the colonels in the field, the captains, uh, uh, because they were field officers, professionals who were usually quite proud to display <clears throat> the discipline, excuse me, and commitment of their troops, so that when you arrived, they didn't greet you as an enemy or an adversary. They welcomed you, and you spent time with them. But the brass at the top, you know, at the headquarters, Saigon, they began to do, to to treat the press as as enemies. Uh-huh. As uh, people who were betraying, uh, you know, the the goal, and in Cambodia, it was uh, even though there weren't American troops, uh, combat troops there, the the uh, the embassy would say. I mean, the acting ambassador Tom Enders in 1973 or four said to me, "You're not being helpful to us," hmm. and I said, "But you know, you <laughs> that's not my job to be helpful." In other words, I wasn't supposed to have written something because it wasn't helpful. Um, and uh, it was accurate. He wasn't complaining about its accuracy, but it wasn't helpful. And a lot of a lot of material wasn't helpful in the Vietnam War, and it was, as Philip points out, different from World War II. Rarely in World War II did you ever see a picture of a uh, a really gravely wounded American soldier. Uh-huh. Uh, and you saw lots of those still pictures and on television in Vietnam. And uh, so, and there were lasting images, and they were very powerful. And in the end, World War II, also, we must remember that not only <clears throat> was it a, viewed as a common effort, but but journalists also were given uh, officers' ranking and uniforms, and traveled as uh, with units as military officers, even though they didn't they didn't carry out military duties. Uh-huh. They they were uh, I don't know what the minimum rank was I think it was captain or first lieutenant. While you were over there, both of you, did you have an opportunity to read what other journalists were writing? Did you have an opportunity to see some of the other dispatches that were coming out of uh, out of Vietnam? Mostly no. You 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 uh, at least in my case you would sometimes see a summary, uh, a version of it on the USIS, the information agency. You'd see something like that at the embassy. But that would be just a paragraph. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, you, I mean, most of what's in this, in this anthology, I had never seen before. And that's what makes it sort of an, an interesting experience for people like me and Philippine. Before I let you both go, I'd like you both to comment on, on, on something we touched on a while ago, which is what do you think we're still coming to grips with as a country from the Vietnam War? We were talking before about the fact that there's still a cultural upheaval somewhere in the body politic out there from this war. Um, Sydney, start with you. Well, I, I think uh, that that cultural uh, chasm is still here. And and, uh, and I think that that uh, there are still lots of people like the, like the, high, the top brass in Saigon during the war who still feel somehow this country has been betrayed by loose living uh, relativists, moral relativists, uh, and and as you say, we saw some of that in, in the impeachment trial, and uh, and I think Watergate and Vietnam were the start of the politics of vengeance uh, and uh, and bitterness. And we've reached new heights, and I don't know where they're going. I think it's tainted everybody who's involved. Um, it's an angry, nasty way uh, kind of dialogue. It doesn't get you anywhere. And um, I think we're still chewing on on each other because we haven't resolved these issues. I think Vietnam is still very much in the air. How can because how- we're not very. This is not a country that takes losing. In stride, right. and and uh, and so we still haven't we haven't digested that meal. What is it going to take for that to happen? What is the therapy that we're going to have to go through to to, to do that? Well, uh, I, I I really honestly don't know. I mean, I think that uh, for, for us to understand, we'd have to understand a great deal more about about uh, suffering uh, uh, and 
sacrifice, and that would probably take some some kind of upheaval on our own shores, and I'm not going to wish that on anybody. Uh Philip, the same question in terms of uh, the social underpinnings of all this and, and, and what we're still feeling from it and how we can come to grips with it. Well, I mean, two things, um, just to sort of reverse the order of your questions. Um, uh, in my own view, you, your your questions about, to me and Sydney, about how can we come to grips with this, uh, what sort of therapy could we undergo as a nation for this, is a very optimistic American attitude. Hmm. It's very much of the idea is is that there's a kind of 12-step program we can go through <laughs> and somehow set this set this to rights. One thing I came out of Vietnam with, um, and I, I have to say to some of my other experiences in the Middle East and in North Africa as a foreign correspondent, that's not very American, is, is, is I feel I came away with a sense of the tragic. That there are things about which you can't do anything. Uh, it doesn't mean that you lo- you lie down and go passive, and just, but, but it does mean that there are things that one must except sometimes in life, and you live with predicaments rather than trying to solve problems constantly. That said, um, you know, the, the, there, there, there were cultural divisions in America bubbling and brewing in the 1950s. You just kind of saw that in the, in the, in the uh, beat generation underground. But those all came uh, exploding to the fore uh, during the 1960s, and 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 the detonator uh, was this confused, morally ambiguous war, which the um, which the establishment was uh, bent on on pursuing, and uh, and to this uh, to this day, uh, we have not just as speaking as a, as a culture in general have not been able to comprehend the fact that we lost effort, um, and that um, we lost it for a lot of reasons that I mean I couldn't go into right now, but it, it's constantly, we, we, we started to play the blame game. It was the fault of the press, or as Sidney pointed out, it was the fault of, of um, the sexually uh, loose uh, moral relativists uh, and so forth. And, and I agree with Sidney that, that, that the politics of, of vengeance the change from a politics of consensus that existed during World War II and, and those early years of the Cold War really began to break down in the, in the early 70s with, with, the, with the Vietnam War turning sour and, and with Watergate. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's gotten worse. That's the thing that troubles me, and uh-huh. so now to speak about a possible solution, I, I touched on one in an article I did recently in George Magazine about the number of Vietnam veterans that there are currently in the Senate and the Congress, and I think, I believe, if I can recall, it's 21 or 22. These are combat veterans, by the way, huh. uh, men who had actually been under fire, and, and I got a letter from one of them conservative Republican from Nebraska, uh, Senator Chuck Hagel. And, um, and uh, I, 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 had, I had said that, that, that possibly the common experience that these men had um, in Vietnam could bring them together even while they may be divided over certain policies of whether, you know, what, what, what do we do about Social Security or tax cuts? So that's legitimate political discourse, but this kind of ideological warfare that's uh-huh. going on uh, would be would be diminished at least if, if as as these men mature and uh, I mean mature in their in their in their in their offices um, and and begin to run the country more. That's I, I have a hope for that, but I I do think a lot of the divisiveness we see in our our body politic now does go back to go back to the 60s. Well, if as somebody once said, uh, the beginning of wisdom is knowing where to find it, certainly uh, <laughs> there's no better place than uh, these two volumes, Reporting Vietnam American Journalism, Volume 1, 1959 to 1969, and Volume 2, 1969 to 1975. Two of the men that covered that war, Sidney Shanberg for the New York Times, and Philip Caputo, who served as a Marine officer and later covered it for the Chicago Tribune. 
I thank you both for sharing your thoughts, your ideas. Thank you so much for being with me this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for listening and joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on 